mean really People like to disrespect my crew But the fact is that you know my name and I don't know you I'm gonna start by reading you a short passage from a New York Times article And I choose this article partly because it is unusually well written China's leaders confront an unlikely foe Ardent young communists Huizhou, China They were exactly what China's best universities were supposed to produce Young men and women steeped in the ideology of the Chinese Communist Party. Here we have a photograph of the students sharing an apartment, an apartment they rented just to have a space to help organize their struggle for labor unions and workers' rights. And here's a somewhat confused and confusing photo of the police in Communist China showing up to shut that down. The caption reads, on August 24th, the police raided the apartment the young activists and workers were sharing in Huizhou, crushing their campaign for workers' rights. These are young people who became sincere communists, just as the system was encouraging them to do, and for that reason, inexorably and inevitably, they became enemies of the system. What the system really wants are silent conformists, people who will not question whoever is in charge, not people who will actually read and understand the lessons of history being presented to them in the textbooks, not people who will ask obvious questions, such as the one posed in the, the, the sign being held up in this protest. This is basically asking, why doesn't the government support the factory workers um, instead of corrupt government officials? <laughs> um, that's the sort of question you dare not ask. So I'll come back to this, but there's an update on this article. There's an even more, more recent article. This one is uh, January 21st, 2019. And it is obviously following the same group of university students as the Chinese government forced them to make confessions on videotape, interrogated them, um, put them in prison. And it's really even too flattering the situation to say they were put in prison. Uh, in the parlance of our times, we would just say they disappeared. Their locations are unknown. They never get a trial. They never get a lawyer. Um, it's observed that in the videotape confessions, they seem thin and tired and seem to be reading from a script. Yeah. The same type of punishment and repression that the communist government uses against anti-communists, they also use against pro-communists. That's the fundamental point here. The same type of repression used against people who were actually part of, for example, the, the Tiananmen Square protests or other pro-democracy movements, or the democracy wall movement, people who want freedom of speech, democracy, liberty, or capitalism, or a parliament, or whatever you want to say, those people are oppressed the same way sincere believers in Karl Marx are oppressed. And that is itself really the ultimate indictment of communism. That's the ultimate proof that communism is a failed ideology, both in theory and in practice. Now, what do I mean? If you go to Saudi Arabia, everyone knows what the government ideology is. And if you sincerely believe in and practice the government ideology of Saudi Arabia, which is a certain form of Wahhabi Islam, following a certain uh, political order and so on and so forth, if you follow the rules and you check all the boxes, you're in and you're safe and you can be self-confident. In China, nobody is ever safe. Nobody is self-confident. People who are themselves members of the communist elite, for example, university professors who I knew face to face, they live in constant fear. Um, you can never conform enough. So any other repressive regime you want to name, um, China is worse. I mean that sincerely. And China is worse because communism is worse. <laughs> China is a country where only one man has freedom. And today, that man is President Xi Jinping. So I continue reading from this article. They, the students, read Marx, Lenin, and Mao and formed student groups to discuss the progress of socialism. They investigated the treatment of the campus proletariat, including janitors, cooks, and construction workers. They volunteered to help struggling rural families and dutifully recited the slogans of President Xi Jinping. Then, after graduation, they attempted to put the party's stated ideals into action, converging from across China last month on Huizhou, a city in the south, to organize labor unions at nearby factories 
and stage protests demanding greater protections for workers. Now again, I made the comparison already to Saudi Arabia. If you are a citizen of Saudi Arabia and you try to put the ruling party's ideals into actions, you'll be embraced and accepted by the ruling party. It's very straightforward. Plenty of people do if you conform and keep up that. Let me just ask, Canada or the United States or even England, what would it even mean for young people to get inspired and get together and try to take the party's ideals and put them into action? Whether you think of the Liberal Party or the Democrat Party or the Republican Party or the Conservative Party, any mainstream party, it actually becomes absurd at a much earlier stage because these parties don't really represent any ideals at all. There's nothing there to get excited about. By the way, I have I have Bernie Sanders' book uh, on my desk at this moment. I'm going to make some videos talking about the airsats ideology that Bernie Sanders presents to the new generation, which, you know, for better and for worse, has advantages and disadvantages. That might be an interesting exception. But for the most part, in the West, we've gotten used to our political parties representing absolutely nothing other than a culture of complaint. Whether the complaint is that taxes are too high and you want lower taxes, it's the Republican Party, or the complaint is, you know, you want uh, free education for a universe, free university or something like this, like uh, Bernie Sanders is offering, or better health care, whatever the case may be. Um, but yes, you know, the Communist Party of China represents an ideology. It represents an economic theory. It represents a philosophy. The economic theory has been debunked. The philosophy has proven to be murderous and disastrous. The ideology became the laughingstock of the whole world back around 1989 to 1995. That was really, I think, the lowest point for communism. And I am old enough to remember 1989 through 1995. Uh, 1997, I was in university, and every day there were communist organizations handing out magazines and leaflets and propaganda on campus. I didn't see, for my generation, I didn't see Hare Krishnas doing that. You know, like I didn't see like religious cult groups doing that. Maybe once in a while Jehovah's Witnesses, you see them on the streets, something like that. But even then, and 1997, they were a complete laughing stock, you know. And they were still out there, still trying, still trying to build the future that they inhabit today. The authorities moved quickly to crush the efforts of the young activists detaining several dozen of them and scrubbing the internet of their calls for justice, but not before their example became a rallying cry for young people across the country, unhappy with growing inequality, corruption, and materialism in Chinese society. Quote, you are the backbone of the working class, close quote, the protesters chanted at one rally, addressing workers at an equipment factory. We share your honor and your disgrace. I got email from a longtime viewer of the channel, a young man who has been influenced by this channel to get more involved with the democratic parliamentary political process. He's trying to make the world a better place as best he can. And he found to his horror that the party he started supporting in Ireland, which is a new party called People Before Profits, the candidate in his writing, the candidate in his county, um, was openly calling for the abolition of capitalism and invoking the name of Karl Marx. Now, I thought about whether or not I should take the time on camera here to actually read through the emails sent back and forth between these people, because he sent me the emails, which is quite appropriate in this case. This is a public figure. This is someone standing for election, being questioned by, you know, a member of his own party who canceled his membership over this, by the way, about, you know, <laughs> why... The question that was put to him was, why do you still invoke the name of Karl Marx? Why do you rely on the authority and the philosophy of Marxism, given that Marxism is linked to the deaths of millions of people, given that it's such a terrible uh, failure, so on and so forth. But I think maybe the most important thing of all is to zoom out and look at the big picture here. He comments, this is him writing to me, not to his member of parliament. He said, I wanted to know about Irish politics and get involved, 
but now I'm even more disillusioned, and I haven't a clue who to vote for in future elections. This is the kind of ultimate outcome of the revival of communism. And I'd say it would be the same with um, various parties that have revived fascism and neo-Nazism. What they tend to rely on, what this politician relied on, is the blanket claim that communism and Marxism specifically are ideals that cannot be impeached by the world of real empirical experience. He says, as his excuse here, um, he claims that communism has never actually been tried, that it's never existed in the real world. Whenever you offer this kind of justification of politics, pause and ask yourself if you'd accept that from the other side. Would you accept a neo-Nazi party that made the same excuse and said, well, Nazism was never really tried. It was never really implemented. It's an ideal. It's not something that exists in the real world. And therefore, Nazism isn't discredited by the real world experience of what happened when the Nazis were power. No, no, you would not. Um, would you accept that even from liberals, uh, pur pur purveyors of liberalism? Um, would you accept them saying to you, oh, well, really, a liberal economy has never existed because a liberal economy is something that's ideal, and here's the definition of the deal. So there's never been a perfectly liberal economy, however you're going to define that. No, obviously, communists judge the real history of capitalism and liberalism and Nazism from the reality of what happened in the real world when those ideologies were put into practice. And yes, it's painful for me to behold this you know, Irish politician. Again, he's not a famous or powerful person. He's a small example from a small county in a small country. And it's, you know, it just happens to be someone who wrote into me complaining about a local politician um, who's clutching at communist propaganda and telling this young man who joined his party and volunteered with the party. He tells this young man, oh, no, no, in order to understand Karl Marx, you should look up these um, communist propaganda sources. And I actually took a minute to Google. Some of them are uniquely Irish communist propaganda sources. <laughs> But it's, again, it's just as sad and sick as if, um, how, would you accept this from a neo-Nazi? Would you accept a neo-Nazi who says, no, 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 you can't understand the real history of fascism by reading these objective sources. They're all propaganda. Just read this source written by our side, written by some extremist, written by some partisan. That's the real truth, unlike the propaganda you find everywhere else. It, you wouldn't find it credible, whether it was the neo-Nazis or the liberals or, or anyone else. Uh, presenting this to you, so communists are far left wingers. You have to you have to be willing to to examine yourself in this light. What is the final outcome of all this? In China, you've just seen when people try to sincerely practice communism, they are shut down and snuffed out by the Communist Party itself. And it's an absurd irony that in a Western parliamentary democracy like Ireland in pluralistic capitalist countries that really believe in freedom of speech, we protect your right to propound and debate communism in a way that communist party ruled countries do not. So we live in Taiwan most of the time. <laughs> We're in Bangkok right now. In Taiwan, the, the communists have more freedom than they have in communist China. <laughs> Melissa's been with me. You, you've seen this. Although they're small in number, there are literally communist protesters, pro communist protesters, on the streets in Taiwan exercising democratic freedom and privilege that they would not have in communist China. Even though Taiwan is at all times on the knife's edge of being conquered by communist China, even though they really do have to deal with subterfuge and um, you know spies, frankly, coming over from communist China. Despite that, the principle of democracy, of freedom of speech, of pluralism is so important that they protect that right even for communists. And within communist countries, they do not. Not even for sincere young university students who, who want to put those ideals into practice, who want to do things like helping poor and downtrodden factory workers. Um, 
the ultimate price for this illusion is precisely the disillusionment it brings for everyone who would possibly be worth participating in politics with. I think that was a poorly structured sentence. <laughs> the point is this. These ideologies, they are going to attract and solicit conformity from some of the stupidest and most vile people in the whole world. And I speak from experience because many members of my own family were devoted, passionate communists their whole lives long. They never grew out of it. They never stopped making excuses for the massacres in Tiananmen Square and the massacres in Tibet. They never grew out of it. They never let go of those excuses. Not even after the Berlin Wall fell. Not after. For them, it never ends. And that is every bit as pathetic as growing up around neo-Nazis who keep making excuses for, for Adolf Hitler. It really is. Um, it's no better. <laughs> um, I've seen that. And those people are still out there. And those people, some of them, they don't even know who they are yet. But they're going to see something that appeals to them in this simple solution that's proposed for complicated problems. When I was living in a communist country, uh, Laos, I was being questioned by uh, my girlfriend at the time, who was Laos and I grew up in Laos. She was asking me what it was my parents found appealing about communism. Because, of course, for her country, communism has just been a disaster. Everyone, everyone just... It's just a crummy system of government. And Laos, I mean, it hasn't been a, a disaster the way Cambodia was. It hasn't been a bit disaster the way Russia was. But nevertheless, it's a long-term, slow-burn disaster. Everyone there knows they'd be better off if they had a government more like Japan, for example, uh, in whatever terms they think about that. She said, what, what was it that your parents found so appealing about communism? And I said to her, you know, it has a lot to do with Vietnam. It has a lot to do with Laos. It has a lot to do with this country. For my parents' generation, they grew up with so much hatred against the United States of America that all they cared about finding in communism was an ugly fist that threatened the power, threatened the hegemony of the USA. And they would believe in and support any ideology that just offered to put a stop to, to put some kind of threat or counterbalance against the United States of America. As I think for them, that was the first step, or that's the first motivation. But then, of course, that's not the last step. They take it further and further from there. And there are people who have that same kind of hatred in their hearts today. And I think it mostly is hatred against American imperialism, whether that's because they've, they've seen film footage of people being, you know, burned to a crisp in Iraq or Afghanistan, whatever the war is in our times that, you know, breaks their heart and turns them against, you know, the, the never-ending wars that sustain American hegemony, whether it's in, you know, the Middle East or South America or what have you. So for many people still today, that is the first step. So there are going to be those people who buy into the illusion with whatever mix of motivations and keep on clinging to it forever and ever and ever. But as I said before, in my poorly structured sense, the real cost of this illusion, precious though it may be to those people, some of the worst people in the world, the real cost is the disillusionment of those who are precisely the most worthy of inclusion in the democratic process. And who end up like this young man, feeling that they don't know where to go, they don't know who they can talk to, they don't know who to trust after they got involved with mainstream parliamentary politics and found out that a seemingly sincere quote-unquote socialist party in pursuit of the same objectives as Bernie Sanders really was a front for Marxism, really for communism. I mean, really, people like to disrespect my crew, but the fact is that you know my name and I don't know you.